in the Songs of Victory, or it also will be on the screen. Let's stand to sing after the introduction. Many at one in the Songs of Victory, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. just take a moment and let's commit our time to him in prayer this evening. Let's pray. Father, we thank thee this evening for the tremendous truth of what we have just been singing. Father, we thank you that whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Father, we thank you for the wonderful simplicity, but the wonderful truth, yet the wonderful essential nature of the gospel and father we thank you this evening that we can sing that wonderful song of praise father this evening we thank you for gathering us in this place tonight we thank you for bringing the reverend mccray amongst us tonight and as we start out on this september series of life stories father we pray that you would be pleased to give much help father we pray that you would help the reverend mccray as he comes to share with us in just a few moments time both in song and in word, that you would bless him 
that you would enable them, that you would help them, that you would undertake for them, and that you would fill them afresh with that wonderful person and power of the Holy Spirit of God, that he would know at his elbow every help that he would need tonight as he ministers and tells of how you saved him and you kept him, and you're still using him even today. And Father, we thank you for your goodness to us in so many ways. And Father, we pray that if there's one here tonight or more that doesn't know this Lord Jesus that we've been singing about, who doesn't know the Savior that the Reverend McRae will testify about tonight, that they will not leave this place without getting right with God, without having that peace of God and the peace with God. And Father, we pray that you would just bless tonight, that you would move in this meeting, that you would undertake for every single aspect, and that you would just be present in all things this evening, we pray. Father, we just take a moment, we think of those of our congregation who can't be here tonight for various reasons, and Father, we pray that wherever they are and whatever state they're in tonight, that you would be pleased to bless them, that you would encourage them even as they watch online, that they would feel part of the service even here tonight. For those who have been bereaved even in recent hours, Father, again, we just pray that you would draw close, that those everlasting arms of comfort would be around and about, and that you would just give much help in these difficult days, we pray. But Father, we pray for now, we pray that you'd be with us, that you would give us help in all these things and we ask them in your precious name amen just want to take a little moment and uh, leave the necessary announcements before you this evening of course this is our first uh, sunday evening in september with the reverend mccray and next week we have uh, roy robinson roy used to uh, be in the police and roy has a very interesting story to tell he's come through numerous illnesses and different things along the life of his career so if you know anybody that would be interested in that you be sure to invite them along and roy will certainly be giving a good life story of how the lord saved him and kept him all down through his life there's still plenty of those leaflets available you take them and you give them out to whoever would like them our sunday school has also started back uh, this sunday 10 30 and if you know any children or you would uh, like to influence any children to come along you're more than welcome there's again plenty of leaflets in the hall you take them and give them out and encourage people to come along to our sunday school here just in the little hall out the back at 10 30 on sunday morning also something for the ladies the women's fellowship will be uh, starting to go again in, in october 13th of october uh, there's these lovely little leaflets again out in the hall you take them and you give them to those who will be interested in that there's a variety of speakers uh, lined up over the next number of months and you'll be made most welcome to that indeed we're going to stand to sing again before the reverend mccray comes to minister to us two six seven in the songs of victory 267 are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the lamb let's stand to sing after the introduction thank you
just call upon the Reverend McRae now to minister to us uh, for the rest of the meeting. Thank you, brother. Amazing grace, 
how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind. Oh, but now I see T'was grace that taught my heart to fear And grace my fears relieved How That grace appeared the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have Thus far, and that grace, God's grace will lead me home. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. And when we first begun, let's sing the verse of Amazing Grace. Amazing, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But now I'm found I was blind But now I see I once, I once was lost Oh, but now Praise God I'm found I was blind Oh, but now the invitation to come and to share with you tonight what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for me and what the Lord Jesus means to me. In the book of the Psalms, Psalm 126, it says these words, Psalm 126. In verse number three, the Lord have done great things for us, whereof we are glad. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we're glad. And then over in Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, whenever the demon of Gadara got saved, the Lord changed his life, and my made a change completely in his life, and that he wanted to go with the Lord. Wherever the Lord went, that's where he wanted to go. But you know the Lord Jesus told him? In Mark chapter 5, verse 19. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, and saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, 
and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. He wanted to go with the Lord. But the Lord says, no, you're going home. And when you go home, remember this man was lying amongst the tombs. Everybody had given him up except the Lord. The Lord came to the right place for the right person at the right time to meet the right need. And though man had given him up, he had left his home because the Bible says he had spent his, his place now of living was among the tombs. He was crying and cutting himself, helpless, hopeless. They actually tried, his friends tried to chain him because he was so energized by the power of the devil. They tried to restrain him. You know what he did? He just tore them asunder, just like a thread. That was until Jesus came. And then when the Lord Jesus came, he changed all that. You know, he was naked, running amongst the tombs. But whenever the people came out of the city to see this man, where was he? He was sitting, not running, sitting. In contentment, in peace, at the feet of Jesus. And he was clothed. And he was in his right mind. Tell me, who did all of that? The very one that I'm going to talk about tonight. And his name is Jesus. Let's pray for a wee word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank thee this evening for the privilege of gathering with this congregation of people to Give honour and glory to thy great name for all that thou the Lord has done for us. We never could cease to praise you. And oh God, I want to thank you from the depths of my heart for that amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And oh God, I want to talk tonight to this people about thy amazing grace that saved. A wretch like me. Help me to be faithful. Help me to honour thy son. Help me to exalt nobody else but the Saviour. For we pray we would see Jesus. And we pray this in the Saviour's precious and his lovely name. Amen. John Newton with the words of that lovely hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And Newton had this testimony because he was once down in the very depths, in the depths of sin. But let me tell you this. Whether the Lord saves you and takes you out of the very gutter, the very depths of sin, or whether God saves you as a child, it's still Amazing Grace. The word grace is five letters, G-R-A-C-E. -E. You say you're well educated. Very simple. Grace, G, great, R, riches, A, at, C, Christ's, E, expense. Great riches at Christ's expense. And tonight, let me tell you this, as far as the world is concerned, you may... You may have nothing, but if you have Jesus, you have everything. Because you have got great riches, eternal riches. Things that money can't buy, because the Bible says ye are redeemed with corruptible things, not with corruptible things of silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Something that's very precious, more than silver and gold. Because let me tell you, all the silver, all the gold of the world, listen, it will lose its value someday might be very important to you. Somebody said, it's very nice to go shopping with. But friend, there'll come a day when silver and gold will mean nothing to you. And they could hand you the greatest check 
as you lie in that coffin. But you'll never take it. Because it'll mean nothing. But you're not redeemed with corruptible things. Things of little value, although man estimates them as great value. But we are redeemed, purchased in the coinage of the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore remember this, right from the word of start of my testimony. I have great riches at Christ's expense. It means the undeserved, the unmerited favour of God. You know there are two words in the scriptures. There's the word mercy and the words grace. And you know, thank God for the mercy of God and thank God for the grace of God. But they're different. They're different. The mercy of God is this. That God does not give me what I do deserve. I deserved hell. I deserve to be cast into outer darkness. But thank God he hasn't given me. And he will never give me that because he has given me something else. He's given me heaven. And eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. My dear friend, do you realize what you have in Jesus Christ if you're saved tonight? Eternal life. And you'll never perish. Neither shall any pluck you out of his hand. What a mighty Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we think of the grace of God. It's different because if mercy is that God does not give me what I do deserve. Grace means that God gives me what I don't deserve. I don't deserve heaven. But thank God that's where I'm going. I don't deserve to be forgiven my sin. But thank God your sins which are many are forgiven thee. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Never to be remembered against us anymore. Notice in that verse in Psalm 103, it doesn't say as far as the north is from the south. It says as far as the east is from the west. Do you know why? Because you can measure the distance from the north to the south, but the distance from the east to the west is the immeasurable distance. Thank God you can't measure it. And that's how far God removes your sin, friend. Do you know what that means? He removes them completely. Thy sins and iniquities, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17, will I remember, listen to this, no more. Now people will throw them up in your face, maybe. And there's not one of us in this service tonight, but let me tell you, every last one of us have a past. And every last one of us were born in sin. And that means that every last one of us have a sinful past. And people can throw that up in your face. But I want to tell you, my friend, the Lord Jesus says, your sins and your iniquities will I remember. God says I'll remember them no more. He's not only forgiven them. He's forgotten them. Put into the sea of God's forgetfulness never to be remembered against us anymore who wouldn't want that and yet the tragedy is this there are many that don't and I'll tell you why some don't want that because they don't see that they are a sinner they think I'm all right Jack you know I was born into a good home I was brought into a respectable family and surely that's enough. Or a, or a church going. I remember going to church and Sunday school and all of those things. Surely my religion's enough. My friend, the Bible doesn't tell me that religion takes you to heaven. The Bible tells me Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then it says this. No man cometh unto the Father. I don't care who you are. 
I don't care what your background is tonight. God knows all about it. But no man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's Jesus. And whenever Joseph was asked what was the name of this child, the Bible says thou shalt call his name Jesus. That's the only word that Joseph is recorded having spoken in the scriptures. But friend, he didn't need to say any more. Because what did you say? Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? Why Jesus? Because he shall save his people from their sins. And it's not until you and I realize that we are a sinner that we will ever be saved. My dear friends, if you have never come to the place where you'll humble yourself before God and acknowledge that you're a lost and you're a guilty and you're a hell-deserving sinner, it's not until you realize that that you'll ever see that you need the Savior. You see, it's not until you realize there's something wrong or you're sick that you, you need a doctor. It's not until you realize you're a sinner that you realize you need a Savior. And I want to tell you simply a little bit of my story. Because I think I said the life story. Friend, listen, let me tell you, I could not tonight tell you my life story. Because we would not only be here to tomorrow, and you wouldn't want that, but that even wouldn't do it. Because let me tell you, I'll tell you why. Because I'm now 74. And how do I put 74 years into a short period of time? So, it's, brother, it's not my life story that I can tell tonight. But I'll tell you a wee bit of it. Let me tell you. First of all, my childhood. I was born on the 6th of August, 1948. I was born into a family of five children. Mum and dad and five children in our home. I had a brother and three sisters. And I was the baby. Now when I say that, let me say this. The five of us, my brother was the eldest and I was the youngest and there were five. And the day I was born, my brother was four years, seven months and six days. And there were no twins. Just steps and stairs. Ten months between two. Eleven months between another two. And that was just a family we grew up together. But in my childhood I never had a privilege that I really feel I missed. It was this. I never sat on a grandmother's knee. I never looked into my grandfather's face. Because on both sides, my mum and dad's side, their parents had died before I was born. And therefore I never saw a grandparent. Now my mother used to tell us about them. She told us about her mother. One night, a wee family of eight children down in the heart of our bow were sitting there in quietness and stillness. Because that night a visitor was coming. It was the angel of death. And death came and took a mother away from eight wee children. But that night something happened. As they were sitting there in quietness in the home, wondering what was going to happen next, they heard singing. And they went down into the little hallway and looked into the, into the bedroom. And there they saw a mother pull herself up onto her bed. And she was singing. And this is what she sang. We have heard a joyful sound. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Spread the glad news all around. Jesus saves. Jesus saves, climb the hills, cross the waves, onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. 
I've often thought about that. I say, Granny, I never saw your face and never heard you sing. But you see what you sang that night before you died? I've climbed the hills of Peru. I've gone up the muddy waters of the Amazon. And you know what I told the people there? Jesus saves. And friend, he still does. For the Bible says he's able to save to the uttermost. All that come unto God by him. And you know there are people tonight and the devil says there's no use you coming to the Lord because you're too far gone. Or you're too hopeless. God wouldn't want the likes of you. Let me tell you what Jesus called the, the devil in John's gospel chapter. He called him a liar. And so he is. And if you're here tonight and you're still in your sin, I don't care how dark your past is. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth from all sin. There's no sin that's clean. It's all dark. People living self-righteous lives and think that that's good enough for a God friend. And yet as God sees that sin, it's as dark as the midnight of hell itself. And so my, gra my granny was singing, Jesus saves. And then she told me about her, my, my dad's father. I'm called after him. And she would tell us as a wee family about Granda. And how that one night Granda was in bed and he said it was a vision he had. An angel appeared at the bottom of his bed. The angel said that God was going to call one of his children and they were going to die but God was going to give him seven more years. In the morning time whenever he told them he said just, just, just an old man old men shall see visions or dream dreams and they didn't believe it because you see none of the family were sick and yet one of the sons shortly after that fell from a horse and broke his neck and he died before he died he said this there is a happy land far far away but it's not far away from me now thank God he was saved and then my granda seven years later my father was putting in a field of turnips and he came in to get something to eat and my granda says to him, Bob, hurry up and finish the field, son, for I can hear the shepherd calling. My father finished the field. That night, the shepherd called. And Granda went home seven years later. You see, those old men of the past, friend, they lived so close to God. They had nothing as far as the world was concerned in many ways. But they had the Lord. Mum used to tell me about her wee sister. She was just coming into her teens. Mother had died and left the family there, but her wee sister was the youngest of the family and she took sick the eldest girl of the family took over mother's place and then one night the wee girl was lying in bed and the family gathered around her and she said gentle Jesus meek and mild look upon a little child pity my simplicity and then she reached up her hands, suffer me to come to thee. And she threw her arms around her sister's neck and she said this, Ah, sissy, heaven's lovely. Good night, sissy. Good night. It wasn't goodbye. 
You see, friend, thank God we meet them in the morning when the night of this old world has passed away. That's the joy of being saved and in Christ. So my mother used to tell us these things, and yet my mother wasn't saved. She knew about salvation. She was raised with a godly mother, and the home that she came into, both granny and granda were saved. But she wasn't saved. Until one night, something happened. My brother came home from a little meeting. And he says, Mommy, I have something to tell you. She says, what is it, son? I was lying up in the top of Mum's bed. And he came in through a room and he bounced in and he says, I've got something to tell you. She says, what is it, son? He says, Mommy, I could save tonight. Now, my mother knew what he was talking about. And she also knew she wasn't saved. But she turned to her son and she said to him, Son, I'll help you the best I can. And friend, God spoke to her immediately and said, How can you help your son to walk with God when you're not saved yourself? And the Spirit of God started to speak to my mother's heart and challenge her about her need of God's salvation. There's a little mission hall just about half a mile from our home, Kurtlassen Mission Hall. And we would go along to those meetings there, and this night there was the Reverend Leonard Ravenhill. And if you ever get his little booklet, Why Revival Tires, I, I beg you to read it. Leonard Ravenhill. And he was the preacher in Kutlassen Mission Hall that night. And I was sitting there next to my mother and my brother and my three sisters were there. Daddy wasn't there. And he was speaking at that meeting. And that night God really spoke to my mother. Son. Now I didn't know this was happening. I was only a child. But God was speaking to her heart since that night. My brother came into the room and says, Mommy, I've got saved. And the word she said, I'll help you the best I can. And the Spirit of God was still speaking and speaking and speaking to her heart. And that night God was speaking. And you know, whenever he was preaching the word, and it came to the end of the meeting, and the appeal was made at the end of the service, my mother said to God, she says, God, if somebody else comes, I'll come too. She had no sooner those words out of her mouth to God. I didn't hear her say that, but she said it to God. That Leonard Ravenel said, God bless you, little girl. And sitting in front of us was a little child who indicated her desire to come to Christ. And then the Spirit of God said, There's the somebody else. Are you coming? That night my mom could see it. And I want to tell you, my friend, to the day she died when she was in her 86th year. I don't care who you were. She had asked you the question. Are you saved? She was totally unashamed of Christ. But that night we were coming home. Let me tell you. That night coming home. We're walking down the road towards home. I said it's only about a half mile. We're coming down the hill towards our house. And my father was coming out with a car. And he was coming up the hill to meet us. Now, if you'd known McCrae's in those days, it was said it was like heaven. There was no night there. Because my father believed either in working every hour that God ever sent. And if you were going out for a keely, as it were, that was to my brothers, my brothers, and my mother's brothers and sister. They lived together. There was four of them lived together down in our boat. And we would go down there, come, maybe coming near 10 o'clock, we'd be going out for our keely. Everybody else was going to their bed. We were going out, and when we went down, we loved it because going down to my aunt's, she always put, maybe at half past ten, she put it on the pan. You older people know what I'm talking about. She put on the bacon, she put on the sausages, and all the rest of it. And it used to be the old lard. It wasn't the special oil that you have today. It was lard. And people say, it blocks your arteries. My father says, do a bit of work, and it'll soon take it out of your arteries. <laughs> and you know, we loved that. And we went down there, and that night, that's where he's coming up the road to go. My mum says to her, don't you say anything to your daddy. Don't you say anything to your daddy what happened tonight. And then she could say it. 
got into the car, four of them sat in the back, and I got in, my mum, beside my mum, and my dad in the front. My dad never asked anything about meetings before, but that night it was different. You see, God works in a wonderful way, doesn't he? And my father says, well, were there many at the meeting night? Oh, yes, it was full. And then he asked something which he never asked before. He said, well, did anybody save the night? Well, my mother looked at me, and then she gasped around the back, said nothing, and, of course, we sat there as just little mice. Quiet as any, thinking that was it over. And then he said it again. My mother says, ah, yes, th th there were a couple. My father said, well, did you know any of them? And my mother says, yes, uh, there was a wee girl, a wee girl could say my father says, but you said there were two. And she says, Bob, the other one was me. And that's what I say, friend. My father had to drag it out of her that night, but from that day to the day she died, you never had to drag out about her salvation. She loved Jesus. My mother... Never prayed in, she prayed out. And I remember used to go as a little child and sit outside my mother's bedroom door. For she went up before dad would come to bed. And she got down at the side of the bed and she would pray. And I heard my mother pray. And I want to tell you, friend, she prayed for me. Didn't pray, Lord bless my family. No, she went down every single one, one by one. Pray that God would save him. Well, shortly after that, Mr. Sanford came to a mission outside Dungannon, Lackey Dungannon, and my three sisters and my brother, uh, my three sisters got saved. That was my brother and my mum, and now my three sisters, they got saved, and that left dad and me. And then one night, the 4th of June, 1957, at eight years of age, I went along to that same mission and I heard about God's wonderful salvation. Now, I had a faithful Sunday school teacher. Sad to say, the preacher in the pulpit never told me I needed to be saved. But I had a faithful Sunday school teacher, Joan, and Sunday after Sunday, Joan would tell us her class about the Lord Jesus coming into this world and why he came and how he went to the cross and shed his precious blood and how that he rose again victorious out of the tomb and how that he ascended to the Father's right hand and how that he was coming again. And she told us all of these things. She warned us that one day we'd have to die. And I must be honest, God was speaking to my wee heart. And I used to go to bed at night and I used to pray two things. I said, Lord, please don't, don't let me die tonight. And Lord Jesus, don't come tonight, because I'm not ready. My mother was praying for me. And then on the 4th of June, 1957, under the preaching of Edmund Sanford, who's in glory, I came to Jesus. Because you see, my friend, the sovereign grace of God became seeking grace for God sought me. You remember Adam was in the garden and Eve? They tried to hide themselves from God because he had sinned. They had rebelled against God. But you notice Adam didn't cry out whenever he had sinned and say, God, where are you? God, I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry I disobeyed you. I'm sorry I rebelled against your law and your command. And God had said to him, the day you eat that forbidden fruit, Adam, you'll surely die. But Adam didn't cry out after God. But God came seeking him. That's the grace of God, friend. God came seeking him. And he says, Adam, Adam, where art thou? No, Adam said, Lord, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid. 
for I was naked. He tried to hide his nakedness from God, friend, just the same way as people try to hide their, uh, their, their, their sin with, with religious acts and religious deeds and religiosity and, and clean living as it were by themselves. But you can't hide from God. God, thou God seest me. God knows all about you. God knows all about me. Altogether. And God called Adam. And that night God called me. And thank God that night on the 4th of June 1957. I came acknowledging as a little boy that I was a sinner. Lost on my way to hell. And thank God he saved me. He promised to do that. Whosoever shall call. This is the word of God, friend. Whosoever shall call. And I was a part of the whosoever. I called that night upon the Lord. I didn't call upon the church. I didn't call on the minister. I didn't call for baptism. I didn't call for confirmation. I didn't call for anything else. I called on the Lord. Why? Because his name's Jesus. Savior. He's the Savior. The only Savior. You look to anyone else and you'll be lost. Thank God Jesus saves, just as Granny sang. And I called upon the Lord. And the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not might be, not maybe, shall be. Who promised that? The Lord did. It's God's word, friend. And you know you could hear a promise from somebody else and it wouldn't be worth that. Because you'd not believe a word to say. But you can believe his word because God's word is truth. God's word is for set, forever settled in heaven. Though heaven and earth may pass away, my word shall never pass away. And thank God I called upon the Lord Jesus Christ to be my Savior. I said, Lord, save me. And that sovereign grace of God, friend, started in the heart of God. And then it became seeking grace for a poor lost sinner like me. And that night it was saving grace. He saved me. Ephesians chapter 2 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith. F-A-I-T-H. Here's another wee word. Through faith. F-A-I-T-H. What does it mean? Forsaking all, I take or trust him. Simple exposition, isn't it? And I simply trusted him, and I took him as my saviour, and he promised he would save me, and praise God he did. And that night I was gloriously and wonderfully saved. That left one, my dad. Now my dad, he was a farmer, I was raised in the farm, he was a worker, every hour nearly got sent. My father was a master of a lodge for 20 years, my grandfather was 20 years before that in Steerstown. My father was a committee member of the church, but he wasn't saved. She can have all of these things that you can boast about, and yet they mean nothing. Absolutely nothing for eternity. If that's all you have, my friend, then you're lost. And you'll be forever lost. And my dad was unsaved. My dad was lost. Listen, he was a member of the church. He was a, a committee member of the church. But he did not know the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. Oh, we prayed for Dad. He brought us to mission after mission because he was the only one that drove the car. But he left the way. He came. You know, there are many people who go to gospel meetings like that, just leave the way they came. Still in their sin. 
until one night, Mr. Sanford was holding another mission. 1959, May 1959. He was holding it down in a place called Ballymaguire Schoolhouse, down the Ballymaguire Road between Stewarton and Coe. That mission had gone on for nearly three weeks, and we went to many nights to that meeting, but Dad was still on save. Came to the last night. Mr. Sanford used to have a wee concertina. And just, you know, it was just a little round thing, and he just played. He used to sing, I dreamed I searched heaven for you, and, you know, there will be a meeting in the air in the sweet, sweet by and by in the lovely old hymns. That night was the final night of the mission. My father got up of the seat just as he did, went to the car as he always did. And then one of his nieces, a cousin of mine, she walked up to my mum. We were heading to the car and said, Aunt Sadie, can I talk to Uncle Bob? Mum said yes. And so she stepped into the car and we stood back. And sometimes later, just the Two car doors opened on Hazel's side and Dad's side and my dad walked down the road that night, walked into the wee hall. My father a proud Presbyterian, and he was. He acknowledged before God, God, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. And he called on God to save him. Let me say this tonight. That was the night I got a new daddy. My dad was good to us. But in drink, I remember running from him. Not to him. But that night it all changed. See, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. And let me tell you, my friend, if you hear of someone making a profession of faith and their life's not changed, they have not repented or turned away from their sin, then all they have is a profession. But they have no possession. And that means they're not saved. It doesn't matter what man said, they're not saved. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. There's a change. And that night the change came on my dad, and I want to tell you. My dad, I remember us going across the fields, bringing in the hay. My brother would drive one tractor, my father would drive the other. And every year we made a hundred acres of hay. And I can tell you it was hard work. And my mother and my three sisters and myself and my brother and dad, we'd go out and bring the hay in. But after that he got saved to remember us, the tractors just driving alongside each other up the field. And us singing at the top of our voices, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. And the roll is caught up yonder. We'll all be there. Let me ask you a question tonight. Are all the family in? Will they all be there? Will we meet in the glory, friend? And thank God that was so. And the Lord changed our home and changed our lives. And thank God we're all now in Christ. I know time's in the way, but listen, I'm only starting in life. I, at school, I went from primary school to the secondary school, or to high school in Cookstown Grammar School. And there was a famous musician there, and actually he was someone who uh, was conducting choirs and conducting orchestras. Actually, it was on the radio. His name was Mr. Peel. I wasn't long in school that Mr. Peel sent a message to my parents and said, I can get your son a scholarship. 
I would like him to go to Westminster Abbey. And I'd like him to become one of the choristers or one of the choir boys at Westminster Abbey. Well, I suppose that was very appealing to them. But I didn't want to leave home. And I said to my mum, I said, if you send me away from home, uh, I'd run away. And so therefore I wasn't going. Thank God I didn't go. But he wanted me to go there. But I started to sing around the gospel meetings. And you know, after I was saved, friend, listen, that's only the start of the journey. It's only the start. Because the Lord is going to lead you again. And I wanted fellowship, but there was no fellowship in the church I was in because the preacher didn't preach the gospel. And so, not far from us, there was a Danaki Congregational Church. Mr. Workman used to be there for a while, and Mr. Finley was there. And I was at the church, and I, I used to go to the youth fellowship there to get fellowship amongst young people and fellowship the one with the other. And I would go, and then we started a choir. It was called the Danaki CE Choir, Christian Endeavor Choir. And we went around the countryside and all the pilgrims' meetings in the country, and I found this choir. My, there had been sometimes over 20 of us. We went around everywhere singing the gospel because we wanted to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I wanted to tell people of their need of Jesus. And so we went there and then something else happened. An uncle took ill. They had no family. My aunt and uncle had no family of their own and I used to go and stay with them. My sister would go and stay with them. He took ill, had his leg amputated. I remember the night going to the hospital, Dungannon Hospital at the time, and I went up and sat with him for a little while. He was still unconscious. And then I had to go home, school the next day, I thought. My mother and my aunt and another sister-in-law sat at the side of my uncle's bed. During that night, friend, my aunt and my mum were away getting up of tea and the other friend was sitting at the side of his bed. And he woke up. And he cried. And these are the words he said. Oh, hell. Hell, hell. And it was gone. I cried myself to sleep many nights because I loved them. But I couldn't change his destiny. And here I'm standing tonight in Cray Baptist Church and my uncle's out in eternity wouldn't it be great if you thought and knew he was in heaven but let me say this friend you'll be where you're ready for and I don't care who you are or what you are or what your background is if you die without Jesus listen to what Jesus said John 8 21 where I am ye cannot come now do you get that Jesus said it the Lord Jesus said Ye shall die in your sins. And where I am, you can't come. God excluding you from heaven because you refused and rejected his son and the offer of his grace and his mercy and his pardon and his forgiveness and his salvation. He stands at the door of your heart and he bids you 
to let him in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And the Savior stands outside the door of every sinner's heart. He longs to be admitted. Eternal life in part. But men and women will not let him in. And Jesus said, Then ye shall die in your sin. People say to me, God is a God of love. Yes, he is. People say, but God could not send a person to hell. I want to tell you, my friend, you send yourself to hell. You take yourself to it. Because you choose your sin rather than the Savior. And if you die in your sin where Christ is, you'll never be. And I don't care who the preacher standing over your coffin. And I don't care what he says at your gravesite. He can lie himself if he wants to. Dust thou art and unto dust thou shalt return. In the sure and certain hope of a glorious resurrection. It's a lie. There's no glorious resurrection for the unconverted. There's a resurrection to damnation. No matter what he says. Because the Bible says, as a tree falleth, so shall it lie. As a man liveth, so shall he die. And friend, as a little boy, teenage boy, I said, oh God, give me the opportunity to tell men and women of their need of Jesus. And God will not only tell them there's a way to heaven, and that's through your son, not through the church, not through the sacrament, but through your son. And the finished work of his cross, because Jesus Christ paid it all at Calvary. He cried on the cross of Calvary, it's finished. He didn't say, I'm finished. He says, it's finished. And the word in the original is, done, work done. And I'm going to heaven because of the work that Jesus did. On the cross of Calvary. Not what he did plus mine, my works. For the Bible says, By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I promise to God, God, if you call me, give me an opportunity. I'll tell men and women, they need Jesus. But I'll warn them of a place called hell. And friend, I'm keeping my promise to God tonight that I made as a teenage boy. I left school. I went into the civil service. My dad begged me to stay at home. We would divide the farm. I says, Daddy, I can't do it. He says, why, son? He says, listen, I'll give you what you're getting in the civil service. I says, Dad, it's not that. I believe God's calling me into his work. And so we did. And I was interviewed way back in 1966, November, as advised to, advised to join the local free church, which was the local one at that time, although I was living at Stewartstown, was Armagh. We had to travel there. My dad took me. And then in February 1967, I was brought before the presbytery, and I was accepted as a student. For the ministry. And I started my studies there. Friend, life's not easy at times. 1980, I took ill and came home with our fifth child. I was in hospital for six weeks. Actual fact, unknown to Anne, 
what they were saying to me if I didn't go into hospital. I couldn't go in until she came home and says, well, if you don't go in, you don't need to bother. Because they thought that I wouldn't live. That's 40 years ago. God's kept me. I say life's not easy because let me say, on the 23rd of August, after we got married, and we got married on the 25th of June, 71. We couldn't get a place to live because nobody would sell us a place in Macrofell. When they heard it was the Free Presbyterian Church, they, they wouldn't sell us a house. I remember we didn't know what to do and was coming up to the wedding and the church committee said, well, listen, we've got to get someone. And then there was a person that got saved and started to come to the church, his mother-in-law. Thank God for mother-in-laws. His mother-in-law, she would buy a few houses and she owned a few properties. And she sent word with Jim. She says, listen, you tell that wee lad, I'll buy the house and whatever it costs me, I'll sell it to the church. Well, that's what it did. I remember the price, 6300 That's what it cost. Highfield Road cost 6300 And it was coming close to the wedding and therefore these people were still in the house and uh, they weren't to get out until just after we got married. And I went to the door and I rang the bell and this lady came to the door, very posh lady, and she said to me, can I help you? I said, yes, ma'am. I was just wanting, I wonder, could I see in the house? No, she says, the house is sold. I said, yes, I know, but I'm the new occupant. Indeed, you're not. <laughs> I says, madam, indeed I am. Well, she says, you're not getting in here. Hard to believe it, friend, but they went the next morning to the solicitor to cancel the deal. But my wee friend had been buying houses for years, and thank God they couldn't have got out, for the knot was tied. And I remember now, I, 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 I suppose I was, uh, I was a wee bit smart that day. I said, Madam, well, I can't get in. I believe you're leaving at, at the end of June. I said, I'm very thankful because you're going to keep the house warm till I come back from a honeymoon. <laughs> well, if she was hopping before, she was hopping more. And she closed the door, and as I said the next morning, she tried to cancel the deal. But thank God we got the house. Oh, I could go on. Listen, God is so good. We came to Macrofelt, let me tell you. I was asked to come to a mission in Macrofelt. And nobody would let us in. I know what the Lord felt whenever he was in the state, you know, when he came, there was no room for them in the inn. Well, I came to Macrofelt and we were looking to get into the CW Christian Workers Union Hall and they wouldn't let us in. And then we asked for the, the uh, uh, British Legion Hall and they wouldn't let us in. Nobody would let us in. So we, how are we going to have a mission? I said, well, now listen, if there's not a hall, we better get a tent. Another problem with no money. You can't whistle without the upper lip. And so therefore we had no money. But you know, God works in a wonderful way because listen, I could stand here. A cow at our farm went down with milk fever. You see, imagine a work starting over a cow. Our cow, that one of the cows went down with milk fever. And she went down to nothing else, only skin and bones. And the old, the, the legs were festering. And they had to put over the rafters in the, out in the, in, in the barn, they had to put the, over there the, 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 the ropes, and they had to lift her up. My father and my mother and my brother had to put her literally up to get her up onto her feet, to try and get her onto her feet. And nothing would do. She couldn't get up. And my mother prayed. And she says, Lord, if you raise that cow, I'll give her to you. Now, the only problem is this, the cow wasn't the mother's. But nevertheless, she says, Lord, I'll give her to you. And friend, this is true. The next day, whenever they were pulling, the cow was able, by their pulling, was able to start to get up onto her feet. 
And then she got out onto the field. And somehow she got to the top road. Now my father, he nearly would have died if they thought his cow, a pile of bones, was in the top in the field at the top road. But there were two men passing in a car. Now I don't know what glasses the Lord put onto those two men, but I'm glad he did. Because they came down into our yard and they said, Tell me, sir, who owns that cow up there? My father was totally ashamed to say it was his. He says, We'll give you seventy pounds for it. And that was the price of a good cow that day. I don't know whether they saw her that she was beef on her bones, I do not know. But they paid the £70 and my father was about to put the £70 into his pocket and my mother said, Bob, that's not yours. And he says, what do you mean? It's not mine. She said, that's the Lord's. At that time we saw an advertisement in the press that there was a tent, listen to me, an army reject tent. So you knew how good it was. An army reject tent. And it was advertised, I think it was 80 or 85 pound. But I got 70 pound. And I raised the other few pound. And we got our tent. Boys, we were happy. But if you have a tent, you need ground. Put it on. And nobody would give us ground. And they turned round and they wouldn't let us anywhere to have a tent. And there was a believer. And he was willing to give it, but then he was got at and the preacher that he belonged to got at him as well and told him not to give it to Paisley or McRae. And he wrote to us and he said, we still have the letter, that he wouldn't give it. Withdrew the offer. But no place to put it. Listen to me carefully. A man by the very same name as the believer. On seeing. Sent a message. Tell you that man McRae. Never let it be said there's not a place to put a tent up for a gospel mission in Macrofast. He says, I'll give them a piece of ground to put the tent. The unsaved man. And we put the tent up, friend. Listen to me carefully. And in the tent, that man got saved. His wife got saved. And two sons got saved. In that mission. It's no secret what God can do. And God saved them. Now the tent, whenever it was a night rain, there were nights we had to put the umbrellas up inside the tent. That's true, because it was an army reject tent and there was holes in it. But I can tell you, I didn't care about the holy tent. The Holy Spirit was there. The power of God was there. And the preaching of the cross was there. And men and women came and got saved gloriously and born again of the Spirit of God. And God blessed the work. And that's why there's a work in the hell tonight. And God did it in spite of what man could do. You see, God says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Then maybe some other time I'll come back and tell you where we, where we left off. But I can tell you this before God. If you're not saved tonight, it's not the church you need. It's not the communion rail you need. It's not baptism, even though I'm a Baptist church. And remember, I was immersed too, so therefore glory to God, we're one and the same. But it's the Lord Jesus you need. And I beg you with all my heart, don't go home without Jesus. You can get to heaven without riches. You can get to heaven without popularity or fame. You can get to heaven without position. But listen to me carefully. Never forget these words. You will never, ever get to heaven 
without the Lord Jesus. His name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Here's my question. Are you saved? Are you sure? Is he your saviour? If not, come now. May God bless his word. Just as we close tonight, we just want to come back to the cross. And we're going to stand the singer closing hymn tonight. There's room at the cross for you. Let's stand the sing after the introduction tonight. Thank you. thank thee tonight for what we have heard from your servant father we thank you for the wonderful grace of god we thank you for that sustaining grace that saving grace and father tonight we pray that if there's one in this meeting tonight who has not experienced this wonderful salvation found only in the lord jesus christ that they would realize there's still room at the cross for one and that precious blood that flowed from the Lord Jesus is able to cleanse and to clear and to clean every single sin and stain. 
And Father, tonight we pray that somebody would come to know the one who is life eternal. Father, we thank you for help given to the Reverend McRae tonight. Pray that you would bless him and keep him as he ministers for thee across the province. Father, take us to our homes in safety, we pray. We ask these things in your precious name. Amen.